All right, well, welcome to my talk on bringing CI CD practices to machine learning with ML Ops. Um, as a heads up, this is the speed run edition. I'm trying to fit a lot of content into 20 minutes, which means I'm going to talk a lot. Um, had to rip some stuff out. I'll be taking questions afterwards in the hall. Uh, all right. So first of all, who is this guy? Who's talking to you? Why do you care? Um, so I started my career 17 years ago working at Malwarebytes, uh, managing product analytics, security, all sorts of fun stuff. Very research heavy, but not very machine learning heavy at that time. Afterwards, I joined this company called Vicarious AI in 2014. There we were doing large scale AI research. Um, at one point I was informed I launched the largest GPU cluster on AWS in the West Coast. That was a very fun job. Um, afterwards, I joined a company called Rad AI. Rad AI is probably my favorite of the AI companies that I worked at. Um, I joined there as the founding engineer in 2018 where we started deploying LLMs back when we still called them deep learning as opposed to LLMs. Uh, afterwards, I went to Explosion working on tools, Aptable where I kind of just took a little break from that, um, and now I'm at Comcast where I'm working on AI democratization as well as CD practices throughout the company. Um, so basically, I started in DevOps, did some security, and then transitioned to MLOps. I'm going to give you a big disclaimer right now that I'm not an AI researcher. Uh, it took me three tries to pass Calculus 1. Not a math guy, um, but can definitely talk about ops. I also wrote a book, Terraform in Depth, and my publisher would absolutely kill me if I didn't actually bring it up. So coupon code, book, fantastic. So what is MLOps? The dirty secret of MLOps is that it's 80% operations and 20% machine learning, which means that if you've already got a foundation on DevOps, it's not as much of a jump to get to machine learning ops. And I want to clarify something just really quick. ML ops is not ML research, okay? If you're a DevOps person, you're not doing the research, you're doing the operations, all right? There's PhDs, math, all sorts of other stuff. That's not part of ML ops. I mean, it assists ML ops, but it is not what we're talking about here. The thing is that AI is software. At the end of the day, you're building programs, you're building applications. Those things include APIs, those things include monitoring. Every single thing that applies to software still applies to AI. AI cannot do anything by itself. It needs something to actually run it. And that is why I say that MLOps is 80% software, because that's what we're focusing on today. So what does the model development cycle look like? All right, it's, it's a cycle. You're going through it all the time. Start off with data preparation. That's got your things like pre-processing, bias protection, all of that great stuff. From there, you go into model training. You know, you research your algorithms, you do your experimentation, there's hyperparameter tuning, there's human validation. From there, you actually serve your model. Maybe it's live, maybe it's batch, maybe you have auto scaling, there's all sorts of pre-processing that's going to be involved, there's going to be A-B testing. All the same stuff that goes when hosting an application still applies to model serving. Then you have model observation, and surprise, all of your application metrics still apply. Model metrics end up being additional stuff. User changes, drift detection are all in there as well. And then of course that model observation creates new data which feeds back into your data preparation and the cycle continues. So that's just like a very broad overview. We're gonna go into each of these sections and kind of talk about how CI CD principles apply. So first we start off with data preparation. So what does it mean to actually prepare data? All right, you have this whole big data what are you doing with it? Well, first you need to clean it. You need to make it so it actually is in the formats you want, it is in the appropriate way you want. Sometimes that also includes doing stuff as simple as adding spell check or removing certain words. Cleaning your data is really about preparing it to make it available. Then there's the data balancing. If you have a data set that's 90% one example and 10% another example, your data is gonna be unbalanced and that could potentially make your model unbalanced as well. So as part of your data preparation, you go through and you make sure that you have enough examples of your more rare use cases. Sometimes that means synthetic data, sometimes that just means going out and finding more data sources. Scrubbing data is also important. Um, I mentioned Rad AI, we were working in radiology. It's uh, very important to deal with HIPAA and other concerns around it. So for there, we wanna scrub any data before it goes into the model, because it's important. Anything you put in the model could potentially come out of the model. So if you're putting patient identifiers and other stuff like that, no, that's bad. Don't do that. Rip that out. Finally, some people tokenize their stuff in advance. Some people tokenize it as they're going. Um, but then you want to package the data up, version it in a way where it's actually usable for training. So let's talk about that a little more. Um, 
first off, data processing is just code. Okay, you're creating libraries, you're creating workflows, you're creating pipelines, but at the end of the day, you're probably programming something in Python. And when you're doing that, you, all of the same stuff that applies to other software still applies. Um, in fact, in some ways, it's even better. Um, because processing code is really an in-out process, it is just so great for unit testing. Like, I, I know that there's some things where unit testing isn't all that great. Maybe you're reaching out to APIs, you have to create all of these mocks, it's very difficult. Processing code is really not that difficult. You take data in, you take data out, um, and that makes it just easy to add to CI CD pipelines. You create more examples, uh, you can work on that. Processing code should also be treated as a library. So what do I mean by that? You want to make sure that you have versioned releases. You want to make sure that you're testing it. You want to make sure that you've got your whole CI CD pipelines involved with it. You want to use things like PyLint, Rough, whatever it happens to be for your language. You should use that for your data processing. Um, and I know that that sounds simple, but you'd be amazed at the amount of people who are just kind of doing their data processing out of Python notebooks. Don't get me wrong, I love Python notebooks, but you really should extract some of that out, put it into a wheel, automate that process, and make it available for your researchers to uh, use. Now, what if we want to continuously deliver data? Okay, when you're working with ML pipelines, uh, ML services, you often have regular data coming in. You're not talking about a static system. People are using the system. Maybe they're sending up prompts and queries. Maybe they're sending in observability data. You're always gathering new data, and the data you're gathering from your models may be even more valuable than the data uh, that you had beforehand. Um, especially since, and we're gonna talk about that a little later, but you know, this data is gonna include things like user feedback. It's gonna include changes that they made. Now, one of the ways you can continuously deliver it is by using kind of event triggers. You know, you, let's say you're storing all of your data in S3. It drops in S3, automatically trigger your pre-processing pipeline. Um, that drops more data in. Now you combine it with your old one. You should regularly be versioning and spitting out data um, on an almost daily basis. And let's talk about what that looks like. Okay, when you're talking about data, just like anything else, you want to version it, okay? But it's not just, you know, what's in my bucket today, okay, it's great. Your versioning is a combination of the raw data itself plus the data library that you're using. So we talked about how we should ship that as a library. Um, yeah, that is definitely gonna be part of it. See, it's important that experimentation is repeatable, and that's why you need to make sure that you can use older versions of data. If you've gone and you've got a model and you're concerned about something, you may want to go and retrain a similar model, and you may want to do it with that same data to see if there's something going on um, around that data. So this is where it's really important to actually version that. Um, and one of the things that comes up here is how do you version that, right? It's not sem uh, a semantic versioning. Like, that works great for your data library itself, it's not gonna work for your data because your data is constantly growing, constantly evolving. And so that's why I tend to use Calver, uh, calendar versioning, which is very similar to um, Semver, but it's more based off of dates. You combine that version with your data library version and you have a data set version. All right, so I mentioned we're gonna be going kind of fast, you're talking a lot of topics. Model training and selection is another big one. I'm not gonna go into big detail about how we train the models because we just simply don't have enough time. But a big question is, how do you actually version your model? If you're pushing that out there, how are you comparing one model to another? The thing is, there's a lot that goes into building a model. You know, it's not just, okay, we have this one program, we ran it, we're good. The data is part of it. The software, and by the software I mean, you know, what did your researchers actually program? How many layers are in their uh, programs? What algorithms are they using? What hyperparameters did they use? You can have the same software and the same data, but with different hyperparameters, and get completely different results. The other thing is, you can have the same data, the same software, the same hyperparameters, but one model might have been trained longer than the other, which means it's also going to be a different model, okay? And that's really important because just because you trained it longer also doesn't mean that it got better. Sometimes it can actually get worse. And so that's why when you're looking at your models and you're doing these comparisons, you need to look at it throughout the, the training life cycle and compare it to the other models that you've generated. Now, model delivery. There's a couple of different ways that people like to deliver models. One of the things I found is that a lot of the inference systems right now, they're really designed for the researchers. They're not as designed for the people putting it into production. And so what they tend to do is you've got a container, maybe it's like an ML flow container, maybe it's something else, um, and it'll often download the weights at runtime. 
And so that's what you see here. You have your model registry, you have your container registry, and then at runtime, it pulls both of those together. Your uh, inference software launches, it downloads some giant file from S3, it gets up and running. This is pretty flexible for the researchers, but when you're talking about deployments, this is actually pretty bad in some ways. And so another way you can do this is actually just embed the model weights directly in your containers. So in this case, you know, you've got a pipeline, you build out your new uh, model registry, uh, sorry, you push it up to your model registry, and then you just automatically build a container that has it baked in. There's some pros and cons to this. Um, for one, your container is gonna be pretty big. You know, it's got some pretty big model weights in it. But the thing that you get by doing this is you get confidence in your ability to roll back. Um, you get confidence in your ability to even move forward because when you test your model, chances are you tested it with a very specific version of your inference system. And so you don't wanna automatically update without testing, but that's actually what happens with a lot of systems. They go in and they update, say, their MLflow container without testing that their previous uh, weights have actually worked, and all of a sudden they're in a place where they can't deploy. And so even though it's a pretty common pattern to have a separate model inference container and then host your weights separately, in most cases, if you're going into production, you really ought to consider baking it in your container itself. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, I don't know if it's the next slide or not, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we make that easier. All right, so we talked about the model training very, very little. Uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the serving and inference. We're gonna put that model into production. So as I mentioned, it's still just a container, but it's a big container, all right? Your models are gonna be fairly big. You also have this whole problem of GPUs that comes up, all right? You know, unlike most programs where you simply just need a CPU, maybe you're throwing it up on ECS, Kubernetes or something, you need to actually make sure that there's a GPU available for you. So kind of just some big advice real quick. One of the things that you can do is make sure your GPUs are actually part of your CI CD pipeline. You know, don't go out and manually make machines. Use something like Packer, build a regular instances, rotate it out, just automate that process. Um, I've got a blog post up on my blog about how to do that, so you could go into some details there. The other things to consider, uh, you know, if you are building your own images, you might as well pre-cache your model into them. You know, if you have a bunch of Kubernetes workers or ECS workers or something like that, and you're controlling those underlying machines, you can still deploy new models to those machines. You don't have to bake it into it, but if you do bake it into that, it gives you the ability to scale up and down much quicker. Um, even if you don't bake it in, it often gets cached pretty quickly, so if you're scaling it later, you're good. At the same time, though, it definitely can speed things up. Um, when I was working at Rad AI, we chopped several minutes off of our launch time simply by doing this. Now, another thing to consider is that GPUs are expensive. You don't wanna have a bunch of GPUs if you can help it. So one of the things that you probably wanna do is use some level of um, inference server. Ah, oh, yeah, let's talk, actually, let's talk performance before I get into that. So model performance is weird, all right? You can launch a uh, model using an inference server and get different results over time. Um, services like Triton, which is uh, managed by NVIDIA, the, the Triton inference server, uh, things like even TensorFlow, if you're still using TensorFlow for some reason, um, all of them have components where when you launch a container, they can send a bunch of pre-queries to it, you know, 200, 300 queries. And that actually helps them optimize the model uh, from an, uh, a performance standpoint. You wanna do that because you wanna get as much out of each GPU that you're using uh, in order to just basically save money. Now, there is a limit to that, of course. You know, you can't just throw more queries at it. You know, it kind of levels off, plateaus after a little while. Um, but definitely consider using one of these inference servers like Triton, which are gonna be just significantly faster than trying to run things through Python. And then consider using a bunch of pre-queries as part of your startup process to optimize your model, and you should be in a much better position. Now again, if you're using something like Python, you're probably not getting that capability. These services like Triton uh, made by NVIDIA, you know, they are tied heavily in with their GPUs. What they're basically doing behind the scenes is just like swapping out opcodes and just seeing which paths are the ones used most often for those types of queries. All right, this is one of my favorites, especially since this is CDCon. Shadow deployments. There is literally no reason to do shadow deployments that I can think of anywhere outside of ML. Now, one of the things I mentioned is that performance with models is weird, right? If you batch a model, for example, if you batch your queries to a model, they will often perform better in the sense that your throughput will go up, but your latency will drop. 
you could go the other way and focus on like reduced latency, but when you do that, your throughput ends up dropping. And so it's very hard to tell how quick is your model actually gonna be in real life? How fast is it actually gonna go? One of the things that have become more common is this idea of shadow deployments where you deploy a model, you mirror the queries that you're sending to the other models, but you just don't send the results back to the users. You, know, you keep them on your production model. This gives you a way to actually see how your model is gonna work in production. Is it going slower or faster than the other model? Does it have different results? And then you can compare those results afterwards. Now, of course, you can also just batch a bunch of queries and do that to actually compare the data results, but the performance results are significantly harder to look at in that way. So we're talking a lot about this. How do you actually measure your performance? There are specialty tools available out there, like MLPerf, uh, which will go through, they'll tell you, you know, are you batching, are you not? What does it look like if you have batching enabled? Does your latency go up? Does your throughput go down? You definitely wanna do this because there's a lot of little settings and a lot of little tweaks that you might wanna do when creating your models and putting them out there. Um, you know, and different use cases have different levels of importance. Uh, for example, if you're trying to spit back models for medical things, you might need to give real fast responses. If you're doing things that where a human is actually chatting with a bot, the human doesn't want to sit and wait there for 40 minutes, you know, to get a response. So you need to kind of focus on latency there. But there are other things. Maybe you're making reports or doing things behind the scenes, and it's okay to just run it at night as a batch process. That's going to save you a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of money, rather. So you need to consider what are your requirements? Do you need high latency? Do you need high throughput? Do you need somewhere in the middle? And then use that to tune your model serving. Um, as I mentioned, MLPerf exists, but again, these are all just containers. Um, they're containers with endpoints. And so you can even use something like Apache Benchmark or any other benchmarking tool. You could build your own. All you're doing is hitting APIs. That being said, as I mentioned, you know, nothing really beats that real world testing, which is why things like shadow deployments are kind of useful. All right, and we're going through this pretty quickly. Um, observability. Again, it's 80% software, okay? You're still checking your memory usage. You're still checking your CPU usage. You're still recording your logs, request per second, latency, anomaly detection. All of that still exists and is the basis for what you're doing. The major difference that comes in when you're dealing with machine learning is data observability. You need to know what data is going into your model, you need to know what data is going out of your model, and you need to monitor that for drift. So if you're in the infrastructure space, you've probably heard about drift before, it's when you're moving away from the state that you desire. In ML, it's when you're moving away from the data that you trained with, essentially. So if you've trained with one population, like let's say you're a company and you, you know, open up into a brand new region, chances are your models might not work as well for that region if you haven't actually trained against it. As you change your populations, as even just pe your population changes their usage of your tools, what they send is going to change, and you need to monitor that to make sure that what you send back is what you want it to be. Um, and so that's why data observability ends up being kind of the key add-on. But a lot of times with that data observability, you still want that near your application uh, observability. You wanna know, is your model reducing the requests per second that are enabled on an individual node? Are they slowing things down so that way you can benchmark and prepare for other stuff? So keeping those entwined, I think, is really important, which is why a lot of people put them in the same thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of people running Elk Stack out there for both application and data observability. All right, that was 20 minutes of me chatting. Yeah, two minutes, let's go I've got two minutes. Um, just a quick follow-up. Um, my book is still on sale, even though it's been a whole talk. Um, it's still there. You can also find me on Mastodon. Uh, ask me any questions that you want. Uh, and according to my publishers, the first five people who reach out to me there and ask me questions get a free copy of the e-copy of the book. Um, so thank you. Um, Right. Yes, this is my first time speaking, thank you. All right, and if anybody does have questions, like I said, you can find me on the Almighty social medias. Uh, my blog is down there at the bottom. I've got a post up there about launching GPUs into AWS and building your own images, should you want to, uh, using Terraform. Um, and I'll be outside in the hallway if uh, anybody wants to ask questions.